good to be in church. Amen. Uh, Brother Larry went over and stayed with Deanna. She uh, had a car accident, her and Michaela, this morning, and um, a little bruised up and shook up, but otherwise okay. Uh, car not so good. So I'll be praying for her, if you would, please. And um, uh, there's, I guess right after that downpour, we had several individuals that had some accidents and stuff, so... I'll be praying for them. All right, let's continue with the principles of study in the Bible, if we could, please. We started off this morning with the most important thing, and that's your heart, and to make sure that your heart is in the right place. And the Bible teaches you clearly that uh, the Bible, look in Deuteronomy chapter, we'll start in 4. The Bible teaches you clearly. Thank you, Brother Brad, standing. Deuteronomy chapter 4. The Bible teaches you very clearly that the most important thing that a man can do Brother Tur- uh, Dick, turn that to uh, Proverbs chapter 30. It would be good. It would be right there in the middle. Um, most important thing is when you come to the Bible is whether or not you actually want the truth. Many people don't understand this thing. An old guy walked up to me this uh, past week here when I was over there in uh, Monticello. And he walked up and he said, Preacher, I got it figured out. He's about 75 years old. And I said, You got it figured out? He said, I do. I got it figured out. And I said, okay, well, lay it on me, boss. And he said, well, he said, this whole thing is a test. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, everything you go through in life really boils down to one thing. Are you going to do what God tells you to do or what you want to do? And he said, I have one problem with that. And I said, what's that? He said, I keep repeating the class over and over and over. (laughs) He said, I keep failing. He said, you know, he called his name and he said, you flunked again, back to the you know, class. And I go back through the class, I take the test, I flunk it again. And then I take it again, I flunk it again. And he said, I got one class I've never passed. <laughs> and I said, well, at least you passed the main bar exam, you get to go to heaven when you die. He goes, well, I got that one right. But now here's the thing about the Bible. The Bible's not just an instructional book. One of the Bibles, when the, you come to the Bible, it's reading you, you're not reading yeah. it. And so what it boils down to is, is God says, well, you love me? Yes, yeah, sure, Lord, I love you. Well, I, you keep my commandments, right? Well, uh, well uh, yeah. But then when it comes down to it, is it just the commandments that are comfortable for you to keep are literally everything that God tells you to do? And a lot of that boils down to choices. All right, Deuteronomy chapter number 4, if you will, please. Verse number 2. Uh, you shall not add unto the word which I command you, for, uh, 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 or command you. Neither shall ye diminish aught from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you. Now that's under the law. And after he gives the law out there, come to Proverbs chapter thirty, and then we'll pray, and you can sit down. Proverbs chapter thirty. And so what we're talking about when it comes to Bible study, you can't add your private interpretation to things. Uh, I'll give you some examples here of this in just a minute, but I told you about a gentleman who started this. Roger, I didn't expect to see you. Your mom's out of the room. I guess she's probably not out of sedation yet. Laughing. Oh, good, man. Well, morphine's good for you. That's a legal... That's, never mind. But I'm glad, and, I, and I'm glad that you stayed there with your mom and dad. That's a blessing to see you over there. I appreciate that. I'm glad your mom came through surgery well. Here's the, here's the thing that it, that it uh, boils down to is sometimes this uh, gentleman, what he would do is, is he'd find an obscure passage in the Bible and then try to propagate his own doctrine by people not knowing the Bible. He would quote enough of the Bible. They would make people think that they were quoting the Bible and that it came from the Bible. It didn't come from the Bible at all. It came from him taking this abstract idea, then finding a verse of Scripture to tie it to, and then propagating, and he built an entire ministry on it. And, of course, now the thing's beginning to come apart and he's beginning to realize that it didn't work out. You say, what was it? It's an interdenominational conglomeration just like promise keepers and everything else. That's for everybody. Well, the Bible's not to get everybody together. The Bible's a divider. You believe what the Bible says, it automatically will divide you from all of that. Everybody's the same and we're all different. You're different. And you need to get comfortable with being different. You need to understand that modern Christianity teaches put down all your denominational, all your doctrinal barriers and let's just all get along. No, I can't get along if you don't get along with the Bible. The fundamental reason for everything I believe comes from words on a page. If I compromise that, I've compromised everything I believe. 
I don't look for what's in common that they have that I have and say, oh, well, we're together on the commonality of, oh, well, God, Jesus died on the cross. Okay, well, we can, can't we just talk about that and not? No, I can't. Because there's more to the Bible than just Jesus dying on the cross. Amen. So what happens is if I hold to the Bible, guess what happens? I don't have to be a jerk about it. People naturally don't want to affiliate or associate with me because I believe the Bible from cover to cover. But I find also in my own personal life, I run across some things in the Bible, and the Lord says, you better not be adding something to that verse that ain't there. Like with the exception of David Peacock, that applies to everybody else. Like, Lord, I know what you're telling them to do. And the Lord's like, I'm not talking to them. When you do your Bible reading, the Lord's not preaching to everybody. He's preaching to you. Proverbs chapter 30, and then we'll have a seat, if you would, please. Look, if you will, in verse number 5, 35. Chapter 30, verse 5. Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in Him. Add thou not unto His words, lest He reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. Brother Danko, you pray and ask God to bless the message, would you please? Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. Revelation 22 now. Revelation 22. And I realize some of these verses are uh, verses that you're familiar with. But it's important that you understand that there's more ways to add to it. I don't want to just point to the Bible revisers. I don't want to just point to the publishers. And I don't want to just point to scholars. Oftentimes, we add things to the Bible by our own ways of thinking. I would call them prejudices. I would call them preferences. I would even say that it might be something that you're just sort of uh, things that you like or that you particularly care about. And so sometimes you add that stuff in the Bible. How many have heard this one? Cleanliness is next to godliness. You ever heard that? Chapter and verse. Hezekiah 3, I think. (laughs) It's not in there. It's right in there next to this verse. Ever heard this one? God helps those that help themselves. Anybody ever heard that? Chapter and verse. One of the things God tries to show you in that Bible is, is He tries to show you His ways are not your, his, our ways and His thoughts are not our thoughts. And one of the things He points out is, is, listen, you can try your best to try to use the Bible and the authority of the Bible to get your kids under control or to try to get your teenagers under control or to do any number of other things up to and including all your positive thinking marketing schemes. Joel Osteen, Joyce Myers, and a multitude of other people are using the Bible as a marketing scheme to put across this positive sort of a, 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 a uh, what do they call the, my, my mind's a little bit dull here, not hard to believe that, uh, motivational type speaking, and they're quoting scripture to make you think that it's spiritual that's there. The motivational stuff they're getting is not in there. The exhortation is supposed to come, but that's to exhort you to have a relationship with the Lord. It's not to exhort you to just be happy all the time. Everybody ain't always happy. Things ain't always good. The real measure of an individual is how they act in the storm, not how they act when it's sun shining outside. I mean, anybody can dance when it's sunny outside. It's when it's storming and when the roof's caving in and the car has flat tire and your engine ain't running right and you can't get a hold of a good mechanic anywhere and, you know, you're having all kind of troubles and problems and things. That's the measure right there of your spirituality, not the bills are paid, everything's going great, no, I had a little problem, a mosquito bit me last night while I was fishing or something. The real measure of an individual is, is what do you do with the Bible when the Bible speaks to you? Do you rest that scripture to your own destruction? And do you say to yourself, well, I know what it says, but I just think trouble right there. I know what it says. It doesn't matter what you think. You say, well, that sounds kind of strange. No, you've been taught to question everything. That's the maverick in you. That's the rebel in you. That's the nobody's going to tell me what to do. Well, the Bible is written to tell you what to do. It is commands. It is not suggestions. The Bible is written and can be believed that if you do what it says, it will always be to your benefit. It is not something that is written to say, I think things will be good for you if you would consider the possibility of maybe applying some of these things to your life and just try it and see how it works. No, he wrote it and said, do this. 
And there's one fellow that wrote a book not too long ago, and he says, well, you know what? In the Bible, he promises you blessings if you do this, and if you do this, and if you do this, and if you do this. And he said, you're promised blessings. Yeah, but you forgot the other side of that. Two sides to the battery, positive and a negative. The negative side of the battery is, is if you don't do those things, then God says He'll curse you. Example, trust Jesus Christ, where do you get to go? I let a little seven-year-old boy back there today with the Lord that. I said, you trust Jesus Christ, where do you go? Go to heaven. Okay, if you don't trust Him, where do you go? Go to hell. You say, it can't be that. It's that simple. It's a matter of choices. You say, what? There's a repercussion for not doing right. The Bible teaches you very clearly. They that sow to the flesh, of the flesh, they shall reap corruption. What's the way out of that? I don't sow to the flesh. There's certain laws that he puts in in action that even if you're saved, if you try to say, well, now that I'm saved, I never sin anymore, hyper-dispensationalist. Now that I'm saved, I don't have to confess my sin. I'm in perfect fellowship with the Lord all the time and all that kind of stuff. You're headed for a train wreck. The Bible says if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. So he clearly teaches us in the Bible that if we don't do what God tells us to do, there are repercussions even if you're saved. And there are repercussions for taking the Bible and twisting it and turning it to make it fit what our preference is. You with me so far? That's a dangerous thing to do. You get so inundated with the media and stuff nowadays and so inundated with scholarship nowadays that people now set themselves as an authority over the Bible and now instead of believing what takes, according to the computers, a sixth grade education to read, they take that now, they break it down and say, well, I know what God says, but here's what He really meant. And that's where your scholars step in sometimes. But I'm not talking about scholars tonight. I'm talking about those of us who read the Bible and then take the Bible and say, well, I know what it says, but under the circumstances, I just... And here comes the second thing, situation ethics. It's right to do right all the time. And it is never right to do wrong any time. Well, but... nah, uh no buts. Say, well, preacher, I know of certain sets of circumstances and all that. That doesn't justify what you're fixing to use them for. I mentioned that to a guy one time and give you this. We'll come to Revelation 22 if you're not already there. And uh, I said to him, I said, it's never right to do wrong. He said, well, they lied in the concentration camps. I said, okay, you got me there. They lied in the concentration camps and they didn't want to tell the people that were getting their, uh, uh, he used, and what's the, what's the girl that hid the Jews in the walls there? And, and something? Anne Frank. And, they, and he said, well, yeah, she lied and she hid Jews. And I said, okay, the lie you're telling, does that match up with her lie? Yeah. <laughs> She's lying to protect somebody's life. Is that the kind of lie you're telling? Well, I'm just saying that under certain circumstances, okay, your circumstances saving somebody's lie? Are you lying on your income tax? Are you lying in your business deal? Are you lying to your wife about where you've been and what you've been doing? You're lying to your kids about being a Christian when you're over here sucking on suds and doing that? I didn't say you weren't saved. I said, you're, I said, is that the same lie that Anne Frank told when she was hiding people from the, Jew, from the Germans from being persecuted, from the Nazis being persecuted? He goes, what, you know, what, a lie is a lie. I said, you know what I know about you, young man? And he said, what's that? And I said, you've already made up your mind. You're going to do whatever you want to do anyway. And now you want to argue with me about it. But the Bible tells me, and a heretic out of the first and second admonition reject, knowing that he that such is subverted in his own mind, being condemned of himself. So I guess you've got a problem with it. I don't have a problem with it. Help yourself. Have a nice day. He said, well, you don't want to talk about it? I said, why should I? You're not going to persuade me. I'm not going to persuade you. I ain't got time for it. Right. He said, what should you do? Foolish questions and genealogy striving against the law. Don't mess with it. He said, what did I do? Walk away from it. Sure. Now, what you have to realize is, is that we all have the propensity to take what the Bible says and twist it to fit our preference. That's what the devil did. In Genesis chapter number 3, if you'll remember, and this is called, if you want to write this down about studying the Bible, it's called the law of first mention. When the devil shows up there, he shows up with a question. So when that question comes up there, question, 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 you want to watch it because he'll generally reveal himself all throughout the Bible with questions, with questions, with questions. Wrong time, wrong place. People ask questions for three reasons. Number one, they really want to know an answer because they want to improve what their, their knowledge or the information about the thing that they're asking about. Number two, they want to know what the teacher knows. And number three, they want to show everybody else what they know. 
I saw the old preacher one time, a guy stood up, and there was probably four, maybe 500 people in that question and answer session, and he stood up back in the back corner over here, and uh, he stood up and he asked a question like that, and, and the question was, was off color. You could tell right off the bat the question was just way out of whack and had no business asking that kind of a question in that sort of a, of a setting anyway. And, uh, and the old preacher said, you know, I, I found this. Uh, uh, people ask questions. He kind of acted like he was addled for a minute. He asked questions for, for three reasons, you know. And he, he quoted a verse of Scripture there. And he said, you know, they asked, and I gave the, they gave the same three, he gave the same three reasons. And then he stopped a second. He said, what was your question, young man? <laughs> he knew what the question was. But he just outed him. Because he knew that the guy asked the question because he wanted everybody in there to come along with his way of thinking about something. And what he was trying to do was get the preacher to put himself in a box to offend some of those people and mess up a meeting. And that was the only reason he was there for. And the guy said, well, no, no, never mind. He said, well, okay, brother. He said, if you want to know that later, you can ask me later. And nobody said, well, I heard him say so-and-so. Everybody knew what he was there for. You say, what was he doing? He's got a particular, what I call a pet peeve. That we call them, uh, in preaching, we call them hobby horses. Mm-hmm. You can listen to certain preachers and they're on the same thing all the time. And they make a lot of motion. Those hobby horses are the kind, isn't that what they call those rocking horses and that kind of thing? They make a lot of motion, but they don't go nowhere. And so he's, on, he's got this little hobby horse. All he ever studied with this one particular thing, and it just happened to be off a half a bubble. It just didn't ring right. It was just, it was just messed up in the way that he thought about it. And he had gone and he had done all this studying and stuff like that. And then he wanted to ask the question because he wanted to corrupt everybody else. Yeah. So then I met uh, Brother Lenses. This had been several years ago. Brother Heiko might have been there. Maybe a few people were there. I know Drina Lynn was there. And uh, the, the preacher had his board up here and so on and so forth. And this guy gets up there and, and he asks a question. And, and the preacher says, I don't understand what it is you're asking. He wasn't ducking the question. And the guy said, well, here's what I think. And he walks up there and he literally takes the chalk out of the preacher's hand. Like that. And the preacher kind of looks at him like, you know, you know, whatever, you know. And he looks down there like, what is this guy? And he gets up here and he, he draws this house and he draws this door and he draws this key over here and stuff. And then he starts going through and he says this about this and this about this and this about this and all that kind of stuff. And he runs through all that kind of stuff. You've never seen such a, 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 a soup sandwich in your life. I mean, and and he gets done with that and he says, and so now uh, the question here as we theorize about this problem is whether or not it's the house, the door, or the key. And Dr. Ruckman said, it's the key. No, it's the door, it's the house. It's the door, it's the key. It made no sense at all. But what this guy had done was, is he had made a, it had made it his project to study whatever it was he was trying to teach. And now he was the authority on the subject. And so he got an opportunity to get up there and do that. You say, well, what do you think about that? I think that that's my, pro- uh, my problem and your problem. Yes, sir. God says it, and we say, well, now I'll determine whether or not it ought to be that way. He says, like I told that young boy today, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man come to the Father but by me. His mother's about to have a conniption fit, worried about the Catholic Church sprinkling him and confirming him and telling him he's saved just because they wed him and saying something in Latin and she's all jacked up about it and he needs to get saved, he needs to understand it. And after he prayed, she says, now I'm telling you now, if you go to that other place over there and they throw water on you or whatever, you're saved now. If you believe what you prayed, you're saved. You don't have to worry that they're saving you again. That's how you get saved. You trust Jesus, that kind of thing. And I was like, Goodness gracious, man. That happened to be my grandson, by the way. And so, that's a blessing if you knew the history. And, and so here's what you have to understand. Sometimes people go through here and they say, well, the Bible says there's one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Is that plain? Well, it's plain to you, but there's a church that has hundreds of thousands and millions of people that say, well, he may be a mediator, but Mary's a mediator, and depending on what saints you need, they're a mediator, and many of you prayed to saints for a long time. Yes, sir, How many of you pray, used to pray to saints? All the time. Okay. So you see what I'm saying? I'm not, I'm not making it up. You're saying, well, I never saw it. Well, you were raised in a different way. But they're raised where they pray to saints all the time. The Bible says one mediator between God and man. And you're a devout Roman Catholic. What are you going to believe? Well, I know what it says, but the priest says. 
and the priest is the vicar of Christ. That's God's uh, uh, anointed down here. That's God down here in place of him. That's the priest. Is, the priest overrides the book. So you know what you do? You believe the priest over the Bible. Sometimes you believe yourself over the Bible. And you've convinced yourself. So it's a lot more. You can even have a King James Bible. Did you know that the biggest Bible that is used or the most uh, prolific version of the Bible that is used by Mormons is the King James Bible? They have a Book of Mormon that goes with it, but they have the King James Bible. They, they believe the King James Bible is the Word of God. How in the world do you get, when you go, and we'll go to it in a little while, in 1 Corinthians 15, if I can ever get past this point, but I feel a little more like preaching tonight, but at any rate, the thing in 1 Corinthians 15 where he talks about baptism for the dead... How can you read that passage and think baptism for the dead is as you going over here to Salt Lake and going around that thing with them cows around the, uh, that big baptismal pool. If you haven't seen it, look it up. It's out there. It's public information. And you go in there and you get baptized for everybody in your family that ever died. I was with my mother-in-law when she died. My father-in-law brought that up to me today. I was with my mother-in-law when she died. You can go get baptized 50 million times for her if you want to. She went to heaven because she's saved. She can go to heaven because you get baptized for her. My dad, you say, well, I need to go, do you need to go to Salt Lake and get baptized for your dad? No, he went to heaven because he was saved. I was there when he died. You say, well, you didn't see him actually go there. Well, that's what I believe and that's what I preach. And so I'm not going to change it and say, well, I know that, but just what if? I, the Bible gave me a verse of Scripture that said I'm baptized for the dead. That's talking about people that are dead in trespasses and sin. And when these kids get up here, it was too much for the morning service this morning. It was so heavy in here. But I was going to use the passage this morning because these kids are up here and this grown woman's up here getting baptized today for people that are sitting out here that are dead in trespasses and sin. And they're showing a picture that they... They buried with Christ and raised again the newness of life. Showing that they were dead in trespasses and sin, but they've been raised again the newness of life. That's baptism for the dead. Amen. Baptism for the dead is the dead in trespasses and sin. And the baptism is an example of them. Else why were they baptized? What's the point of doing it publicly if it's not for lost people to see a public testimony of your salvation? It's not you go jumping in a giant pool with cows around it and being dunked however many times dead people are in your family. That's occultic witchcraft. That's demonic stuff. You don't get bad. You can't say no being bad. But the Bible says baptized for the dead. You don't mean dead physically. Right. You can't be baptized for that. Otherwise, that makes you a vicarious atonement for that person. That means you don't need the blood of Jesus Christ. You need Brother Mike to come get baptized because Uncle Bobby died. And so Brother Mike says, oh, Uncle Bobby died. I'm going to go get baptized. How come Mike gets to get baptized for Uncle Bobby and somebody else can't? Some of them, their whole family gets baptized. I guess that person really needed saving because they're all getting baptized for the same uncle or aunt that was lost. And then here's the thing. If you're a different denomination, they think you died and went to hell, so they get baptized for you just so you make it. You say, well, they got verse of Scripture, traditions, things they've been taught. Don't bother me with what the Bible says. I'm going to add to it. And we build a religion off of what a man by the name of Joseph Smith started writing and did and just sat down and took bits and pieces of Scripture and formulated a religion. And if you study him, you'll find out he was a rebel. Amen. Started his own thing because he couldn't do what he was told to do. Imagine that. <laughs> Revelation chapter number 22. I want to help you with this stuff, but I, I, don't, I don't want you to get the idea or the impression, especially when it comes to family or close friends or something like that. And you start believing the Bible, you'll find out right quick whether they're a Bible believer. Oh, amen. Yeah. Amen. Yes, sir. And you will find out when it comes time for family reunion and you sit down at the table yes, sir. Yes, sir. and they're flinging biscuits at you. Yeah. And you feel this kind of cold wind blowing at the table, you know. <laughs> and you're thinking, man, what's going on? You know, aren't we supposed to all be saved? Yeah, there's something about you. Yeah. You're the one, oh, here they come. Oh, they're here. You know, they're passing around the wine bottle and you turn your glass upside down. No, thank you. Amen. Well, I mean, you know, just a toast. Uh-uh. I ain't toasting. Well, put some water in your glass. No, somebody will think it's vodka or gin. I ain't doing it. You say, why? Principle of the matter. Why you got to be different? 
Why you got to be the same as everybody? Why are they putting pressure on you? You ever notice this? I'm going to get to this in just a second. You ever notice this? An individual gets saved. Everybody's so worried they're living wicked as the cotton-picking devil and doing things they ought not be doing. And they get saved and they start going to church, reading and believing the Bible and try to develop a prayer life and win people to Jesus and passing out track. And then all of a sudden, the same people that were worried about them being so wicked are like, y'all need to chill out a little bit. I mean, we're glad you're saved now, but you need to, like, relax. Read the fine print, as that guy told me one time. Hey, man, when you get up there, Jesus is going to have a 10-gallon hat, big old belt buckle, a few long necks, and some chicks sitting on his lap, man. You guys are right. You're, you're crazy about this stuff. You're down here to enjoy life. I'm here to enjoy life, not lasciviousness. Right. He said, you need a religion like I got, he said. And I said, really, what's that? He said, well, you do whatever you want during the week, and you go see the priest, and he'll tell you to say some Our Father or Hail Mary or whatever it might be, and maybe you can buy a couple of indulgences, and then you don't have to worry about it. You can just go ahead and do what you want. That's one of the biggest fornicating adulterers I've ever seen in my life. And he did it under the mask of religion. He never missed Mass. Mass, what a name for that. That's not like something, you know, it's, it's cancer. It's a mass. That was funny. It's the best I can do tonight. <laughs> Revelation chapter 22. You say, what are you talking about? I'm talking about you messing with the book. And I'm telling you, the part of the reason you have trouble sometimes even around here is because you're bringing to light the things the devil doesn't want you to know. It's the biggest divider of everything you believe because they can't get around that book. Right. Well, I know what it says, but you know, in the modern day in which we live, well, Jesus ain't changed. That's right. Amen. Amen. It's still wrong. I think I told them about it, the fellow, I don't remember now, so many days in a row here. I mentioned last night something about the guy shacking up, or did I do that here this morning? This morning. This morning. This morning. Yeah. Okay, well, I'll leave it off. Good <laughs> illustration. Yeah, all right to shack up, that kind of, is that the one I mentioned? Okay, all right. Revelation 22, verse 18, For I testify unto every man that heareth the word. Yeah, I did mention that this morning. I mentioned it to you because he went to the Old Testament. Remember I told you? Okay, all right. I I did that for my benefit. I'm just making sure. Sorry, I'm running a little slow here. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. Now that's written for the time period of the tribulation period because he's talking about plagues. But then he goes on a little further. And if any man shall take away from the words of the prophecy of the book, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. Question. You can't lose your salvation. What is your part in the book of life? And number two, what is the place in the holy city? That's a Christian. You are the ones that inherit the new Jerusalem. You lose your pecking order up there for pecking at his book. And when you start taking stuff out and start trying to make stuff fit, you say, Preacher, you carry it too far. Well, wait till we get the judgment seat of Christ. I'd rather the Lord get on to me and say, Peacock, you just like went a little too far. I mean, I know what I wrote, but I didn't really mean all that for you to just take that literally. That's the third law in Bible study. You always take it literally unless there's no way to take it literally and then you apply it spiritually. The whole book of Revelation is literal. It's not spiritual. All right, take your Bible, if you will, please. That I give you Second Peter chapter one this morning. I think I did about private interpretation. All right, come to First Corinthians chapter fourteen. First Corinthians chapter number fourteen. Now, I'll try to get through this thing a, a little bit tonight, but these are important things in Bible study. People say, "Well, I read the Bible, I don't understand it." Keep reading until you do. That's one of the best pieces of advice I ever got. A fellow told me one time, he said, do you read the Bible? And I said, I do. He said, do you understand it? And I said, well, no, I really don't understand all of it. And it kind of bothered me for a while. And I thought, well, I just got to study harder. I got to study harder. I got to study harder. And I didn't have time to study at that time. I didn't have time to work at it. And the old preacher said, one time as an illustration, he said, oh, I don't understand that thing. He said, I'm reading down there Luke chapter number 16. And, you know, the rich man in hell lifted up his eyes and, and uh, see the ladders in the bosom far off. And he said, you know, this and that and the other. And he fared sumptuously. And the dog came, licked the sword, blah, blah, blah. And in hell he lifted up his eyes and this and that and the other. And he said, and then uh, Lazarus uh, went down to Abraham's bosom. Uh, what's Abraham's bosom? Oh, I don't know what that is. Just keep reading until you find something you understand. Yeah. And I stopped right there and I thought, now what did he just say? He said, I don't know what Abraham's bosom is. 
But he said, keep reading until you find something you do. And I thought, man, what a novel idea. That I may not understand everything that's in the Bible, but I just keep reading until I find something that I do. Lo and behold, I found out that's what the Holy Spirit does a lot of times. I get hung up in that thing in Zechariah about the, you know, the, the horses under the myrtle trees over there and they're wandering around and someone says looking around for his daddy's uh, donkeys and that kind of a deal. I don't get any of that. I read through the genealogies and stuff and I know it's connected to Jesus and all that, but I don't get a lot out of that kind of stuff. It's dull as a mud fence as far as I'm concerned. And I keep reading on through there and all of a sudden I find a verse in there and the Lord says, how about that? Do you understand that? And I'm like, man, I get that one. The Lord said, well, see, don't worry about that. Worry about the one I I showed you. Right. Process of elimination. I kept reading until the Lord spoke to me. Amen. I spent a lot of time laboring over it, trying to get it, trying to get it. What does he mean by that? Break it down word by word and try to figure this word, this figure, figure this, figure this, figure this. And then I realized sometimes God don't turn the light on on certain verses because you don't need them right now. You may need them later on, but he's got something he wants to say. Don't stop until he speaks. Amen. I'm a big advocate. When you get ready to read your Bible, just read until the Lord speaks to you. I've had him read as soon as you open the Bible and you start reading and you go two or three verses and bang, there it is, boy, right in your face. It's like, okay, I got that one. Sometimes it's encouragement. Sometimes it's a rebuke. For me, most times it's a rebuke. I have a tendency to look at that. I figure the Lord's getting on to me or something. I have a bad habit of that. But I, I start reading through there. Sometimes I read eight or ten chapters and I don't really get a lot out of it. I know when you read, you know, it's just jumping off the page at you. Sometimes I'm reading and I look down and I go, what did I just read? That ever happened to you? I'm reading it, you know, but I'm like a robot. My mind's somewhere else, you know, and the next thing you know, I'm looking and I'm going, how did I get here? Like driving home last night, I'm thinking, how did I get to Tallahassee? Where am I doing over here? I'm supposed to be going the other way. I'm just kidding. All right, 1 Corinthians chapter number 14. 1 Corinthians chapter number 14. Look, if you will, please, verse number 40. 1 Corinthians 14, verse number 40. Now, this has to do, you have to understand things in light of, of, of the consistency of God's Word. Remember how I told you you never interpret an unclear passage with another unclear passage? Right. You always interpret an unclear passage in light of the clearer passages. So when he talks about your baptize, your one baptism and all that kind of stuff, before I turn that baptism into water baptism, I go get all the passages there on baptism and find out that baptism is a spiritual baptism and has nothing to do with water at all in light of the clearer passages. You never make a doctrine or, or profess a doctrine based on one verse of Scripture like Acts 2.38. Or like we'll get to in a minute over in 1 Corinthians about tongues and those kind of things. All right, 1 Corinthians 14, verse number 40. The Bible said there are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial, but the glory is the celestial one and the glory, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. So what he's saying there is is that there's two different bodies and he's explaining it to you and he's going to go down through here when you start looking at it. God gives it a body as it pleases to him as far as verse number 38 is concerned. Every seed is his own body. All flesh is not the same flesh. It's not. My dog ain't the same as me. Amen. Amen. He got hair all over him. You're the only animal that has to wear clothes. Every other animal is born with his clothes. Chickens have feathers. Birds have feathers. Fish have scales. Animals have fur and hair. You have to have something to cover you. You're naked. So you're a different thing. That's to show you're not an animal. You're not grown with the fur. You've got to put something on. Something has to die for you to get clothing. So that's just a little thing. No, it ain't a little thing. Jesus Christ had to die for you to be clothed in His righteousness in order for you to go to heaven. It's not a little thing. Everything around you is there. I have on a leather belt right here. You say, what happened? A cow died to give me the belt. Blood was shed. Leather shoes. Cow died. I guess, I don't know if they sheared the sheep too close. Well, I guess that's wool. I don't know what it is. But at any rate, they, they sheared an animal to give me the clothes I wear. You say, why is that in there? Something has to die for you to eat. Something has to die for you to wear something. Somebody's pointing to them. What about the heathen in Africa that don't know? The Bible says nature itself proclaims it. How come you just shed that animal? Something had to die for you to live. That's Jesus Christ. He had to die for you to live. So the preacher, everybody knows that. That's pretty sophisticated stuff right there. There's a consistency that's in the Bible. There's a consistency to making sure that you clearly understand that God doesn't break that continuity throughout His Bible. That's what's important about rightly dividing the Bible. It's important that you get that. Don't violate those clear passages. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Never base a doctrine on a rhetorical question. 
or a question that for for, uh, uh, for that matter any question. You don't base a doctrine on something that has a question mark behind it. Doctrine's based on something with a period after it. Here's a good one for you right here. Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels and have not charity, I become a sounding brass and a tingling cymbal. Paul spoke in tongues, therefore tongues are okay. How'd you get that out of that? He didn't say, I did it. He said, if I did, though I speak, if I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I'm become a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. What does that mean? Come 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. What you're saying is, is that, well, I want to speak in tongues. So because I want to speak in tongues, I completely ignore what we're fixing to go into in the book of Acts. Now, if you have been through with me in the book of Acts on this thing about tongues before, then you can take a nap and then we'll be done in just a little bit here. But you need to understand there's a resurgence now of tongues. People are coming up and saying, well, it's okay to speak in tongues. You're starting to hear all kind of demonic things and all kind of unknown things, people speaking in these languages and talk and so on and so forth. And they say, well, it's the tongue of angels. The tongue of angels is Hebrew. How many of you know that? A few of you. That's a tongue of, of angels is Hebrew. Guess what? Paul spoke with a tongue of men and angels. It's not tongues. He spoke Hebrew and he spoke another language. That's men and angels. The angels speak Hebrew. Alleluia is Hebrew. The Bible says they'll restore unto them a pure language and in the eternity or out in the millennium, that's Hebrew that's there. Are you in 1 Corinthians chapter number 15? Look, if you will, in verse number 29. 1529. This is the passage I gave you about being baptized for the dead. So you can build a fence for it now that you understand what it means. Else what shall they do which are baptized for the dead if the dead rise not at all? Isn't that what they're showing here is the resurrection of the dead here? If the dead rise not at all, why are they then baptized for the dead? If there's no resurrection, you with me? then why are you showing that there's a resurrection? What's the point of getting saved if there's no resurrection? So why are you being a public testimony for something that ain't going to happen? That's the context of that verse right there that a religion has built that, what I told you about earlier, on not to repeat that thing for you. So what you have to realize is is that sometimes people come in and they decide, I'm going to make a decision as to put that stuff where I want to put it and make it fit my religion. Isaiah chapter... Uh, 28, Isaiah 28. You say, preacher, what do you think will happen to somebody who adds to the book in order to propagate their own thoughts or religion? I believe if they're saved, Mm -hmm. they lose their place, they lose their part in the book of life. They don't lose their soul, you can't. But that's more than just for Bible correctors. More than just for people that translate. It's a dangerous thing when you start twisting the Scripture to fit what you want to try to talk somebody into doing something that you know ain't right to do. And you use the Bible to do it. Secondly, the Bible says this of the Pharisees and the Sadducees that taught. The Bible says they have a place reserved for them in the lowest hell. God treats them worse than He treats somebody like Hitler. You can kill millions of people, and God says, yeah, you can kill millions of people, but when you damn somebody's soul, that's more serious than putting millions of people in ovens and burning them. You're dealing with eternal damnation. I don't know how to make that point any more serious. That's why when we deal with somebody's call to preach around here or call to go to the mission field, it's a serious matter. We're not questioning their call to preach. It's that they clearly understand the gravity of what they're fixing to do. It's not just so they can have a ministry. It's not just so they can go around here and try to use something that's happened to them to try to do something because, oh, well, what happens if you know? You better be careful about that thing because if God sees that thing as compromised, you ain't getting nothing for it anyway and you may cause a problem on the other end and that may mean eternal damnation. The big difference in burning somebody in an oven and their physical body or their physical life stops and their spiritual life continues for eternity. I was telling, I think it was Brother... Roger and his dad at the hospital today. We prayed there with Maxine and we were getting ready to walk out and he was talking about a Jewish lady he's been dealing with at the nursing home. Him and Brother Kim and them fellows go to the nursing home now and and appreciate that very much. And they're dealing with this Jewish lady and he said, I've been talking to her and talking to her and talking to her and trying to get her to get saved and she's 100 years old and she's getting pretty close to the end. And I said, uh, 
are you asking for suggestions? And he goes, well, yes, sir. Is there a way to reach her? And I said, I have no suggestions. I said, first of all, the Bible says they're blinded in part. The only way they can get it is if they admit they're wrong, that Jesus wasn't just a prophet and wasn't just a good man, but there's a possibility he was the Messiah. Then the Holy Spirit will turn the light on where they can see it. But as long as they're not willing to admit they're wrong about what they believe about Jesus, Jesus will let them stay blind and they'll never see it. But then after a while, I got to thinking about it, and I turned to the tall one there, and I said, can you imagine being in, say, Auschwitz or Treblinka or, or Buchenwald or Dachau? And your rabbi is praying Old Testament prayers and saying all this stuff and praying the Psalms and this and that and the other. And you're watching your babies go in the oven. You're watching your women being abused and then thrown into an oven. You're watching people dropping dead like flies and then murdering people. Don't you think you'd come out of a situation like that wondering where in the cat hair is God at? It'd be good for some of you to read some of that stuff. It's horrifying. You say, why? Because it's coming on the earth now. They're going to shut us down for martial law and all. You stop making it about you for once in your Amen. life. Amen. Stop playing off of people's anxiety, trying to make people panic. In the old days, we'd put you in jail for yelling fire in a movie theater. You're just stretching stuff out to make people get all worked up. But can you imagine? You should read some of that, is what I was saying. You say, why? History repeats itself. You stop and think for just a minute how that'd be for you. And what it does for me and what uh, Brother Roger said was, he said, well, thank God I was born in America and got saved and got a chance to hear the gospel. Man, I don't know. If I came out of a situation like that, I don't know if I'd get saved. After I saw my family go through that, now maybe you're more spiritual. People say, I'd like to be born at the time of Jesus and all that kind of stuff. Not me. Have me removed. Y'all spirit, more spirit. Y'all assume you'd follow Jesus. Not me. I'd probably be with Pilate. Kill him, man. He's creating an insurrection around here, causing problems. He's disrupting my peace. I know human nature. You want to get rid of anything that disrupts your peace. That's, that's the way you are. That's why you vote for certain people in office and certain people out of office for your own comfort. I know human nature. I know me. That guy's causing me a problem. Eliminate him. You good godly people, y'all aren't that way. <laughs> Until it's your neighbor or somebody pulls up next to you in a boom box. Don't you know that Jesus Christ saves misfits and individuals like me and you? Do you realize if Jesus hadn't stepped into your life where you'd be? Don't take credit for that. You say, who'd you be? You could be a murderer, a raper, a robber. You could be a pedophile. You could be a drunk. You could be a drug addict. You're not here because you're good people. Right. If you're a good person and you think you're a good person, you better check your salvation because you take your place with thieves. Amen. Amen. If you're visiting with us, we're glad to have you, but all we are is just a bunch of saved hypocrites. Yes. I tell people, here's how I talk about y'all when I go away. I tell people, I say, we own the word hypocrite at our church. And they're like, I said, yeah. I said, we all know we're hypocrites and we own it. We admit it. We don't try to duck it. We're like, yeah, we're hypocrites. <laughs> I said, at our church, we are saved sinners. And they're like, you can see him. They're like, what? How dare him? No, come to church. They'll ask you, who are you? Saved sinner. We know better than anybody else. We're just saved. That's something he did for us. But we don't forget who we are. Saved sinners. And if you can't take that place, there's something wrong with you. You still think too highly of yourself. If a man thinketh more of himself than he is, he deceives himself and the truth is not in him. More high, what does that thing go? More highly than he ought? Brain burn out tonight. Isaiah 28, uh, verse number 9. I'm almost done. Hang with me. Uh, 28, verse number... Yeah, that's it, 9. Whom shall he teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. For precept must be upon precept and upon precept, upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. You know what he's telling you there? You don't learn the Bible if you stay on milk all your life. A lot of you come from churches and all they ever taught you was on a regular basis, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, all they taught you on a regular basis was how to get saved and how to get somebody saved. As if that's all there is to, to the Bible. Second Corinthians chapter number 
2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. I knew that didn't look right. 1 Corinthians 2. But after you're saved, you start developing a relationship. There's more in the Bible than just salvation. Matter of fact, salvation is mentioned very little. The most prolific thing mentioned in your Bible is the second coming of Christ. You never do wrong telling people about the second coming of Christ. You never do wrong telling people to look for the rapture. No man knows the day or the hour, preacher. No, but you know the times and seasons, stupid. Or uninformed. You know what that Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5? That Bible says you know perfectly when he's coming. You ever think about that? You're a Christian and you know exactly when Jesus is coming. But the Bible says no man knows the day or the hour. That's what he says in Matthew, but he says in 1 Thessalonians in Paul on Epistle that you Christians know perfectly. Well, how can I know perfectly when one place it tells me no man knows the day or hour now the Son of Man and neither the angel in heaven but only the Father? Because you're going to be there when he comes back. You'll be up there in heaven and already past the judgment seat of Christ and the marriage supper and you'll have on your white robe and you'll be crawling on your white horse and you'll hear the horn blow and you'll go, I know exactly the exact time. I know perfectly when the second coming of Christ is because I'm part of it. You've got to get your Bible right. You'll know. You say, well, it won't be no surprise to you. But he says, for them it'll come as a thief of the night. And for them, but they say peace and safe, sudden destruction. For them, for them, for them. But for you, he says, you know perfectly. You got it. Yeah. Amen. Quit trying to figure out the day, the, 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 uh, the, the, the day and hour. Just know this. The closer you're getting to the second coming, the closer you're getting to the rapture. So the Lord will be blowing the horn here maybe any time. I don't know. It could go another few years. So I told you, I always tell you, I teach you to be ready to die. You're ready to die, you're ready for the rapture. If it happens tonight, okay. This kid's back here today, and his mom says to him, now you need to know, if, I, if something happens, I'm hearing stuff I've said for a long time since she was little. I'm hearing her, she says, if, 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 if we leave here, now I don't want this to happen, but if we leave here, and, 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 and a bus hits, or, or a semi hits us, and we die. I want to know. I know where I'm going because I know when she tells about when me and her mama were sitting there on the bed and when she got saved and all that. I know when I got saved. But you need to know when you get saved so that something happens to you know, that kind of a deal like that. I mean, man, she was busting his chops, boy. I mean, she's like, can you, Dad, help him, help him. You know, and, then, and I'm like, well, I can't get a word in edgewise, man. <laughs> she wants that kid to get saved. I got more of a blessing out of that. You say, why? I've been praying for that a long time. Her mom had been praying about that a long time. She ain't perfect, but she's thinking the right stuff. Amen. She's thinking the right stuff. She's thinking about where's the kid going to go. Sure. Good. Sure. She said, well, if he doesn't do it, she whispers to me, if he doesn't do it, is, is he still under the age of accountability? <laughs> she's figuring any kind of way she can to make sure that kid gets there. Well, good. God's starting to use that kid to get her attention. That's a blessing. I like it. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter number 2. Let me try to give you this one and get you on out of here. Um, two, more, two more passages and I'm going to give you this, okay? It's making me feel better anyway. I feel like I'm giving you a little more something this morning. I just got tongue-tied. Uh, 9, 2, 9. But as it is written, I have not seen, neither ear heard, neither entered the heart of man, the things God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. So how are they interpreted? You get off the milk, God gives you the deep things of God. Why? Because he's the author of them and you have the author inside you. For what man knoweth the things of man save the spirit of man, small s, which is in him. There's certain things every man knows, but you don't know the things of God. Save the spirit of man. Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. You don't know them without the Holy Spirit. You've got to be saved to get it. Yes. Now, notice what he says. Now, we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, Holy Spirit, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. What are those things? The deep things which I have not seen, neither ear heard nor the end of the heart of man. And then he says, which things also we speak, not in words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth. Here it goes. Comparing spiritual things with spiritual. 
So you're talking to an unsaved man about spiritual things. He ain't going to get it. He says man doesn't know those things. But when you talk to somebody that has the same spirit, that individual gets it because the spirit inside him is teaching him things and bearing witness to him that I'm trying to teach also. So ultimately, even though it's coming out of my mouth, it's the Holy Spirit teaching you. It's the Holy Spirit using my tongue and a Bible to teach you. And then the Holy Spirit says to you, now see what it says in the Bible and see what he just said right there. That's not him talking. That's just Balaam's donkey talking. I'm trying to show you something here. And it's the Holy Spirit that's doing the teaching and the Holy Spirit that is doing the, the, the teaching, I mean the speaking and the teaching. Right. The Holy Spirit's teaching you. Amen. We don't need a man to teach us, but that's how God set it up. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that were lost. Amen. So that's how he does. Verse number 14, the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. They are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. Amen. So if you are in a position, come to the book of Isaiah, and I'm going to close with this. Isaiah chapter 29. So when it comes to Bible study, you've got to be saved to get it. And the Holy Spirit can't be grieved or quenched when it comes to that because He's the one that gives you the teaching on it. And if He doesn't give you the teaching, you ain't going to get it. So then what you do is you try to interpret with man's wisdom. There's your Bible revisers. There's your modernist. There's the individuals that are setting things up and saying... I know what it says, but I learned these words mean in such and such when I went to school. And as a result, we can know from the conclusion, no, uh 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 You're now transliterating words that are in English into your own interpretation. Well, that word really means, it means what it says. And you don't want to change those things. All right, now I'll give you this last thing. This will end you on a positive note here. You always give the benefit of the doubt uh, to the Bible. You always give the benefit of the doubt to the Bible. Amen. If you're not sure, trust the Bible. Amen. So that sounds kind of, but we're talking about Bible study. Well, I'm, I kind of doubt that. Mm, okay, well, then you better just give the benefit of the doubt to the book. Amen. Give it to the book. All right, verse number 9. Uh, 29, 9. Stay yourselves and wonder. Cry ye out and cry. They are drunken, but not with wine. They stagger, but not with strong drink. For the Lord hath poured out upon you a spirit of deep sleep and hath closed your eyes. The prophets and your rulers and seers hath he covered. Who did that? Verse 10. Who did it? The Lord did it. The vision of all is become unto you as the words of a book that is sealed, which men delivered to, uh, to one that is learned, saying, Read this, I pray thee. And he saith, I cannot. For it is sealed. Natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit. He only has his own wisdom to be able to do it. Alright? Watch. For the Bible says it is sealed. And the book is delivered to him that is not learned, saying, Read this, I pray thee. And he saith, I am not learned. Wherefore the Lord said, For as much as this people draw near me with their mouth, and with their lips do honor me, but have removed their heart far from me and their fear toward me is taught by the precept of men. That's the commands of men. Therefore, behold, I will proceed to do a marvelous work among the people. Watch how he does, how he describes a marvelous work. Even a marvelous work and a wonder for the wisdom of their wise men shall perish and the understanding of their prudent men shall be healed. The book is shut. They can't get it. You say, why? They're talking about it, and they say they fear Him, but their heart's far from Him. You tell me you fear God and don't believe in hell? You mean you don't fear God enough not to preach one of the most prolific doctrines in the Bible? Jesus thought it was important enough to preach it Himself. You tell me you fear God? You don't fear God. You're protecting your reputation. A gospel without hell in it is a lopsided gospel. It's not just about heaven. There's a guy right now, what he's teaching is, I, I just got it, is a, 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 one of our students. And he called and he said, Preacher, could I please talk to you? Or send an email thing and, and said, can I please talk to you through the school channels and all that? And I said, sure, man, here's my number, call me. And he called me up and he said, Preacher, he said, uh, uh, this preacher came in and the first thing he did was take away the pulpit. This is one of your students. 
He said, take, take away the pulpit. He could have come in. As soon as he got there, he took away the pulpit. And then he came in and changed the carpet. He changed the tile and stuff, give the place a new look, changed the place from being called a church to calling it a campus. And he got up and he told the people, he said, we're not going to be singing out of a hymn book anymore. And he said, that stuff's just contemporary. You just didn't know that when they wrote that stuff years ago that it was considered to be contemporary music in those days. And nowadays we sing it like it's scripture or something. It was never considered contemporary. That's a lie that he just said and nobody checked him out. And he said, we're going to follow these things. And they have these choruses and stuff up here that nobody knows. And then all these people got saved. And I said, okay, well, good. Praise the Lord. They got saved. And he goes, well, wait, wait, wait a minute, preacher. He said, he said, he never has said one time from the pulpit hell except when he first came. He said, I am not a hellfire and damnation preacher. And if you call me here, I want you to know up front, I'm not preaching hellfire and damnation from the pulpit. He teaches you're saved from your sin and that you're saved to, get, to live forever. He never tells them about if you don't get saved, you're going to go to hell and burn like a french fry and then come out of that thing, stand before God and be cast in a lake of fire and lose your bodily shape and so on and so forth. He said, he's never said that. And I said, well, I don't know whether them people are actually saved or not. And I said, what the guy's doing is he's turning your situation into a purpose-driven church. He said, the whole thing has gotten contemporary now. And he said, now what they're doing is they're waiting for the old people to die out, literally. And he said, they have a service or a few songs for them, and then they have the contemporary stuff come in. This just happened. When did I send you the letter? A week ago. Uh, And he said, I don't know what to do. And he said, I was raised in this church. And my family, my mother and father, were founding members of this church. What am I supposed to do? And I said, "Uh, pass the salt. (laughs) I said, I don't know. Can you stay in a church like that? He said, it's just grieving me. I don't know what to do. I said, well, it's not your place. To, it's not your church. If that's what your people want to have, you have to decide whether or not you can go along with it or you have to find somewhere else to go, I guess. So what do you think about that? I think that preacher doesn't fear God. He's trying to protect his reputation. He comes from following a guy out of California. Modern, modern, modern. You know what he did? Uh, he sent me the links to all the stuff and the preacher said well when I came here there was cracks in the parking lot and there was weeds growing up through the parking lot and there wasn't anybody coming and the church was going down the tube and it was looking bad the doors were busted off the hinges and, and he said first of all he said it sort of stretched it just a little bit it wasn't quite that bad but it had the tendons and all had dropped off and then I stepped in there and now we've had in the last year 150 salvation and they got a church full of young people there and they're saying oh we're having us a great we're having a great revival here and the old people are dropping off like flies because they're like, well, it's too much of a price to pay. You say, what do you think of that? Oh, well, the church is still going. So that must make it okay, right? You know what else he said? He said, one thing you don't need is preaching on why the King James Bible is the Word of God. He said, preacher, we're known as a Bible-believing church. I said, the next thing that will be going is the word Baptist off your sign. Because they don't want to be affiliated with it. And he said, well, I guess it will have to be. I don't know what the kid ever did or not. I don't know if he sent a pretty nice letter and stuff about appreciate talking. He's heartbroken. He said, I can't have my kids in there. How can I have my kids in there with that stuff? He said, it's all this huggy, touchy, feely, counsel, help. It's like a, walking into a 12-step program or something. I said, modern church, brother. Modern church. That's what they're doing. That's what if God doesn't keep his hand on this church. Say, no, preacher, now, uh-uh. If God doesn't keep his hand on this church, it can turn just like that. Say, it'll never happen. Oh, boy, you are one step from it happening. You better believe it could turn on a dime. All it takes is for a few people to sit and start talking and start creating decision and discord and start, well, I just know I picture these so old-fashioned and all that screaming, yelling, pumping, all that sweating and spitting and stuff. And I just happen to like these new songs and I don't know why we know these songs so la, 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 la. And the next thing you know, you get this thing going and everybody thinks, well, it must be some giant insurrection. It's ten people. And so the people get nervous, especially when you get old. And it's like, well, I don't want to change and I don't want to move. So they just change it right from underneath you. That's after they got you doing everything in the church and you got a position now and you depend on that money to, to, uh, to, to feed your family and so now they got you hooked up or they give your wife a job in the school teaching and so you got to come to church there or your wife loses her job 
You say, never happen. Oh, yes, it does happen. Sure it does. You say, what do you think of that? I told you what the Bible says, but it don't matter what I think of it. The Bible says when you start doing that stuff, boy, the Lord's up there unloading your reward to the judgment seat of Christ, and I'm not so sure about your place. I didn't say you wouldn't be there, but there's something about the place that you would have had in the New Jerusalem that looks like you won't have. God don't take kindly to you messing with that book. So maybe think about it. That's Bible study. You come to Bible study, ask, here's the thing, I'll say this and I'll close. I think it's the third time I said it, so three strikes, you're out. <laughs> Let me help you with this. You come to the Bible and you read some passages, you don't understand what they say. Before you grab a commentary or a, or a, 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 a concordance or a dictionary, stop a minute. And maybe God's saying to you, why don't you talk to me about it first? Yeah. And bow your head and say, now, Lord, I, I, I really do want to know what you're trying to say to me here. And I, I want you to talk to me. And I, before I go look and see what somebody said about it, can you show me? You talk about God getting real in your life, man. Amen. You talk about your Bible reading coming to life. Lord, I don't know what that is. Put a little star by it. You'll be surprised. You'll be reading a week from now or you'll hear a sermon a month from now. And all of a sudden, it'll come down. The Holy Spirit will deliver that thing right across the plate, waist high. And you'll think, oh, there's, there's the answer to that thing. And the Lord said, Amen. sure, man. I, I knew it was there. Just wanted to see if you'd wait instead of going and look. Amen. Try it. See if it works. It makes the Bible come to life. It's not just ink on a page. All right. I hope that helps you. I look forward to seeing you Wednesday. I'll be here for questions and answers this Wednesday. And hope you'll come for questions and answers at... Uh, 6 o'clock, and then we'll have a regular service at 7. All right, let's stand together and we'll be dismissed.